Good day to you and welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. We have a very special program indeed for you today. Uh, at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce to you a biblical archaeologist and historian. Uh, this gentleman uh, that we're honored to have with us today holds a uh, Master of Arts degree in Biblical Archaeology and History. Uh, he's a member of the Archaeology Institute of America. Uh, in 1972, he was elected as a fellow to the uh, uh, Society of uh, Antiquaries of Scotland, and in 1976 he was honored with an honorary uh, doctorate degree in literature. And at this time, it's my privilege to introduce to you Mr. E. Raymond Cap. Mr. Cap, I want to tell you how much of a pleasure it is to meet with you and work with you on this project. Uh, we thank you for taking time from your busy schedule to be with us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Have a chance to show somebody else my work. That's great. It, it's, I think it's a good idea that we're doing this program because we receive letters from people continually asking, well, what is Mr. Cap's book, Jacob's Pillar, about? And that's what we intend to do today, ladies and gentlemen, is just kind of give you an overview a little bit about Mr. Cap and his history how he got started in archaeology, and then we're going to go and touch on each of the books that, that we have here at the chapel that, that are written by Mr. Cap, and kind of give you an overview of those. Mr. Cap, what is the difference between general archaeology and biblical archaeology? Well, actually, uh, there's no difference whatsoever. Uh, the the, uh, work, they have, the uh, work they do is all exactly the same. Uh, the only reason why they call it biblical archaeology is the work is found in Bible lands, hmm. or it could be any land that were, it has their people, rather, in other lands that have connection with the Bible. So actually, there's really no difference between the two. They're both the same. I see. You know, a lot of people think that science and Christianity are at odds with each other or conflict with each other. What would be your response to that comment? A lot of people believe that, and that fact, that's one of my goals, is to make science and the Bible compatible. And I've been, I think, successful doing that. I, I believe so, too. That's one of the goals that we have with our documentaries that the Shepherd's Chapel does as well, is to bring the Bible uh, and science in, con in conjunction with each other to where the, that there, is no, there are no holes or gaps there. And when there's uh, seem like there's a uh, conflict between science and the Bible, most of the time it's because the translators made the mistake, not the Bible itself. It's, the word sounds like it's opposite of or opposed to science. It's a translation that would give us a problem. Exactly. Very good. How did you get started in archaeology? That I remember. I'll never forget that. Fifteen years old, out in the desert with my father, gathering dead wood for our fireplace. And in a wash in Barstow, California, I picked up an arrowhead. That thing turned me on. I had to start asking questions to myself. Who in the world made this? How did they make it? What are they living out here for? There's no water, there's no food. That started my quest for ancient man right there. And then biblical archaeology, well, what turned you on to that? Well, first I have to say this. I did spend about oh, quite a few years in archaeology. I ended up in a Massacre Lake cave looking for Indian relics. Uh, I went to a meeting one time in Hollywood. A man was giving a lecture on the Great Pyramid. Huh? That turned me on. That was the second turn on I had. Uh, after the meeting was over, he was there by himself from England, and I invited him out to have dinner with me. I said there were two hours picking his brains and talking to him, and I got turned on the Great Pyramid. In fact, I had to, I had to see that for myself. So it wasn't too long after that before I, my wife got a job at a factory to make the money to pay my way, and I bought a tour going to Egypt to see the pyramid. Well, the tour I bought happened to cover, I didn't realize at the time, covered Jerusalem, the Holy Land, Baalbek. Petra, and even uh, Greece and Italy. So when I came home from that, I got my exposure to biblical archaeology. I dropped the Indians right then. And every time since, I started studying on everything I could on Bible archaeology. In fact, I got a teaching degree finally. I won't take the time, but I got a teaching degree in California, lifetime teaching credentials on biblical archaeology and history. And so that's my... I get Dr. Adam Rutherford, who's a man from England, really, you might say, uh, got me started in biblical archaeology. I see.
They came from the cold and hostile north, pillaging monasteries and putting whole villages to fire and sword, and they profaned the churches. From the 8th century in England, all places of worship resounded with a new and fervent prayer. Deliver us, O Lord, from the fury of the Norsemen. The fear the monastic clergy had for these violent raiders was vividly penned by one of the English monks. The bitter wind is high tonight, it lifts the white locks of the sea. In such wild storm, no fright of savage Viking troubles me. They have desecrated the sanctuaries of God and poured out the blood of saints around the temple of the Most High. So wrote the scholar, Al Queen. Never before has such terror appeared in Britain. And they came to the church on Lindisfarne and seized all the treasures of the Holy Church. They killed some of the brothers, some they took away with them in fetters, and many they drove out naked and loaded with insults, and some they drove into the sea. And drowned. This cruel and violent raid is illustrated on the Viking stone in Lindisfarne Museum, showing the raiders coming ashore with their axes raised. Towards the end of the 8th century AD, Scandinavia, composed of Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, had only a population of about two million. But from the start of the 9th, its peoples began to increase significantly. There were several reasons for this. The northern climate was slowly getting warmer and harvests were increasing. Thus the people were being better fed and getting stronger. More and more living room became essential. Scandinavia was a land where habitable areas were few and far between. Thus the Viking people began to look outward from their home towards the west. I am E. Raymond Kapt, biblical archaeologist and historian. Countless books have been written about the short Viking period between the 8th century AD and the 11th century, but written records contemporary with that period are rare. Just a few sagas telling of their deeds which vary between the boastful and the mystical. There are reports, mostly from their victims, Viking raids on monasteries, mass murder of entire communities, and the taking away of male and female slaves. However, spectacular archaeological discoveries in modern times have made it possible to piece together not only their beautiful ships, but what the Viking Age was really like. And it turns out to be a somewhat different scenario from that which had been previously been told. They developed just laws, a system of democracy, the basis of which has been adopted by many modern nations. In this program, you will be presented with a wider view and a fresh perspective of the Vikings, who became a major influence throughout Western Europe, and most importantly, reveal the little-known biblical origin of the Northern European peoples, out of whom, at a later stage, came the Vikings. The origin of the word Viking is obscure. It is most likely based on the Old Norse word vik, which means fjord or inlet. Thus, as most Viking longships started their long journeys from such inlets, they went a Viking. But just who were they, these swift and terrible men who came from the icy places in the far north and the snow-covered mountains and fjords of Scandinavia? The Northumbrian scholar Alcuin claim these violent raids were a punishment on the sinful English. He admonished them, like the ancient prophets of Israel, 
on account of their adultery, avarice, robbery, violent judgments, luxury, long hair, and flashy clothing. The Franks of France called them Northmen or Normans, which gave the name to the country Normandy, and the Germans simply called them Shipmen. Shipmen indeed, for the Vikings were people of the sea. Their long ships, some of the most elegant seagoing craft ever constructed. These Viking ships were not only beautiful, but they were highly functional. Being of shallow draft, they could be rowed far upstream to attack cities like York, but needed no turning circle as they could be as easily rowed going astern as forward. Construction was mainly of oak, the lengthwise hull planking being assembled together clinker built style. That is, each fore and aft plank overlapping the next below, and each lashed or nailed to the crosswise ribs, allowing the ship a very considerable degree of elasticity in a heavy sea. The keel was shaped from a single piece of oak, masts and decking being of pine, and the prow was often very highly decorated with animal carvings. A heavy steering oar, called a steerboard, was slung over the right side of the ship, steerboard giving us the nautical term starboard. A large square sail was rigged amidships on the single mast, which, in a following wind, could give the ship a considerable turn of speed. In a reconstructed Viking ship, a speed of 11 knots was recently lauded. At the top of the mast, the brass vane showed the direction of the wind, and at a later date, many of these vanes appeared on the tops of church towers. Two of these beautiful craft are on display in Scandinavia, the Yukstad and the Asaberi ships, recovered from their long burial by archaeologists and their helpers. The Yukstad ship was discovered in 1904 and is about 75 feet stem to stern, about 15 feet broad and weighs seven and a half tons. It draws only one foot of water, loaded, making it a superb craft for onshore raids. This is the Ossabury ship, and she was more of a ceremonial than an ocean-going vessel. As with any modern yacht, these ships needed a ship-to-shore boat, and in Kirkwall Museum on Orkney, such a dinghy has been reconstructed. On the full-sized long ships, there was usually a crew of 32, with a spare crew resting. Thus, rowing could be kept up continuously. The hull gave with every movement of the ship, and in a strong following sea, the sides would twist out of true by as much as six inches although the hull remained watertight. This degree of flexibility not only allowed these ships to ride huge Atlantic rollers, but surf ride down the other side into the troughs. It must have been a real roller coaster ride. The Ossabury ship is dated to about 900 AD and was found to contain the bones of two women who had been laid in a wooden burial chamber aft of the mast. There were three beds, three sleighs, and a beautifully decorated four-wheeled cart. The Vikings were absolutely obsessed with their ships and regarded them almost with reverence. These two long ships were really pieces of sculpture. No plans were used by the shipwrights, but they shaped them until they looked right, all by eye.
and they lovingly decorated their curving prows with animal carvings. What so astonished the coastal hamlets and villages of England was the speed of the Viking raids. Their ships would suddenly appear out of the morning mist, running up the surf to ground on the beach, disgorging a double line of yelling, howling, shaggy men, all armed to the teeth. The Vikings were well aware of the psychological effect of surprise, speed, and noise to strike panic into the population. Then, after only a few hours ashore, they would vanish out again into the cold, gray North Sea, laden with monastery treasures, gold, jewels, and illuminated manuscripts, and in particular, silver. It was silver the Vikings especially coveted, and they left usually not without male and female prisoners, although some of the girls became quite willing brides, perhaps glad to be rid of their quiet life on the English coast. In addition to slaves, the Vikings were not averse to cattle rustling, and whenever they saw a danger of running short of milk or meat, a trip to the English coastline invariably provided a cow or two. Vikings made many raids up the broad rivers of Europe to sack and burn the monasteries, the best source of booty. After one such successful raid upriver in France, one prisoner, Popa, the daughter of the Count of Bayou, stands defiantly before the Viking chief, Hrolf, who later married this beautiful captive. In the 10th century, Paris, capital city of France, was then only a group of houses and churches confined to an island in the middle of the river Seine. Ragnar the Dane, with a fleet of 120 ships, sailed up the river and besieged the town for some months, but was eventually persuaded to leave with a present of some 7,000 pounds weight of silver. This set a precedent much copied by other Vikings. Why bother to put the city to fire and sword when you can terrorize the inhabitants into emptying their vaults? There were so many placid rivers in northwest Europe that access to the hinterland was easy for Viking ships. London was another lucrative target. This is the modern London Bridge. Olaf Haraldsson's fleet sailed up the River Thames and secured ropes to the piles supporting the bridge across the river. Then all the ships pulling together downstream, they uprooted the bridge which collapsed into the Thames mud. The sole casualty, according to tradition, was one Viking who laughed so much that he fell overboard and was drowned. In the days before astronomical scholars put forward the outrageous theory that the Earth was not flat, captains of European ships preferred to keep the land in sight. To leave it and sail to the horizon would endanger the ship falling off the edge. Norse captains, on the other hand, kept the carved prows of their longships headed for the far horizon until shortly before 1000 A.D., one ship, blown further west than any before, saw a land which they referred to as well-wooded and with low hills, America. However, this ship did not land but sailed on. Ships such as this reconstruction on the clifftop at Ramsgate, Kent, were the first to sight the New World, long centuries before Christopher Columbus's fleet arrived. In such a ship, Leif Erikson decided to explore this new land. And arriving on the coast, he sailed along a grim cliff-lined shore, which he named Heluland. Further south, he landed his crew on a sandy beach with well-forested hills inland, which he named Markland. This was Labrador. Recorded in this saga is Leif Erikson's overall name for this newly discovered part of America, Vinland. Vikings from Greenland made one further attempt to colonize Labrador, and early in the 11th century, three ships landed and formed a small community. At first, encounters with the local Indian tribes was on a friendly basis, with many goods being exchanged and bartered. 
Indeed, so amicable were the initial contacts that even this young Viking girl appeared to have no fear of these well-armed tribesmen. Keen though they were on the fresh milk from the cows the Vikings brought with them, they were somewhat wary of the wild antics of this one. Later still, another explorer named Thorald landed even further south and encountered a different group of Indians whom he named the Skraelings. But for no apparent reason, he killed eight of them. A fatal mistake, for later on a mass attack by the Skraelings killed Thorald and some of his crew. During the three years of the colony's existence, a baby boy was born who was named Snorri, the first Nordic child to be born in America. But due to the continual enmity between the Skraelings and the Vikings, which often resulted in vicious local wars, the colony failed, and the remainder returned to Greenland. America was thus encountered and settled by the Nordic peoples long before Columbus. Remains of the first Viking settlement was discovered by the Norwegian scholar and historian Helge Ingstad, in 1962 when he found the remains of a village on the northern tip of Newfoundland at Leons Au Meadows. It is believed that Viking exploration went as far south as Virginia. So much for the west. Exploration in the east was not accomplished without considerable resistance and many Vikings never saw their homeland again. But Swedish Vikings were greedy for the exotic wares of Araby and explored up wild, uncharted rivers in Russia as far as the Black Sea. They ruled Novgorod and founded a dynasty at Kiev. They even dared to attack that mightiest of cities, Constantinople, now Istanbul, where the Viking chief symbolically hung his shield on the gateway of the city. The Vikings' valor and bravery in war so impressed the Byzantine rulers that they recruited them into an elite military unit, the Varangian Guard, which for centuries protected the person of the emperor. Vikings are usually thought of as spending all their time raiding, but this is incorrect. They were basically traders, trading from Spain to the Black Sea and from Scandinavia to North Africa and Egypt. One of the more important trading centers was Hedeby, on the German-Danish border. It controlled the routes from Uruk to the Baltic Sea. In such trade centers was produced iron tools for the farmer, weapons for the warrior, bone and antler carvings, including chess sets, bronze castings, leatherwork, furs, skins, walrus ivory, pine marten pelts, beaver fur, squirrel fur, amber, falcons, an elegant and artistic jewelry. Here and there along the Hedeby waterfront were slave markets. This one sells a young Saxon girl from England. Although it is true that the Vikings indulged in slave trading prior to their conversion to Christianity, usually the girls were well treated, and many became brides of the Vikings. The traditional belief that the average Viking was a bewhiskered, evil-smelling, and usually inebriated lout can now be balanced by some terse notes in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which referred somewhat petulantly to the unfair advantage Viking youths had for the favors of English girls, as the young men spent much of their time ensuring the cleanliness of their clothing, bathing frequently, and combing their long blonde hair and beards, if any. Judging by the many combs found in graves and needles for the stitching and repair of clothing, Vikings seemed to be very conscious of their appearance. And even the Viking chieftain had to submit to a haircut while his wife stood by being critical. 
An interesting insight into the Viking mind shows that silver was his favorite booty, although it is gold that is so universally sought. Silver was accumulated in vast quantities, and not only through plunder. Viking merchants traveled the great Russian rivers, exchanging furs, honey, weapons, and slaves for supplies of Arabic silver coins. Although the Norse people did not use coins for exchange, but operated a bullion economy in which transactions were calculated by weight of silver, coinage was melted down and was cast into ingots. Clothing for both men and women was basically of wool. Women designed and made their own clothes and wore round or oval clasps to fasten shoulder straps. They both wore wool cloaks or capes out of doors, wool being the best to combat the extremely harsh northern winter. Cloaks were held in place with finely made pins. The famous two-horned helmet, which has always indicated a Viking, is a myth and was never worn. Instead, a simple leather helmet was worn in battle familiar as the Norman helmet, and it included a nose guard. Winter evenings were usually spent eating and drinking, especially the latter, and bards were much in demand for the recounting of poems and sagas. And while these somewhat dramatic events were being held to amuse the adults, the children enjoyed themselves by playing board games. And fathers who got tired of the non-stop boasting preferred the company of their children outside. Board games such as these have been found in many graves from the Middle East to the Baltic. Although the violence of the raids on the English coast have captured the headlines suggesting that the Vikings spent all their time plundering, this is quite incorrect. Farming and trading took up most of their time. Grass was grown as a crop, and the resulting hay stored for the many horses the Vikings had. Barley, oats, and rye were the most important crops, but wheat flax for linen, and hemp for ropes were also grown. As well as crops, there were domestic animals to be attended to and milk. Hunting and fishing helped to provide extra food. there was an abundance of salmon and trout available in the many mountain streams. Seal meat and sea fish were always in abundance in the deep water fjords. The village smithy was a vital part of the community, and smith's tools, anvils, hammers, and tongs have been recovered from many graves. The smith was also essential for the making of the fearsome Viking swords, their most treasured possession. They were often beautifully decorated with silver inlay and twisted wire. So much did the Vikings honor their swords that they gave them names. Leg biter, bone splitter, and iron teeth. So important a part did the village smith play that one artist commemorated them in this wood carving. A woman and her children often joined her husband in the fields, but her primary responsibility was to look after the house. She cleaned, spun thread, sewed, wove cloth, and made and washed garments, besides milking the goats and cows. The bunch of keys jangling at her waist signified her authority. Her main task of the day was to prepare the evening meal for her man and the children, while the man of the house chopped logs for the coming winter, which could be harsh. The atmosphere, though smoky, was warm and cozy, and a pleasant odor of meat cooking filled the room.
Though so far north, these Viking areas could provide a surprisingly large variety of food. While the sea was alive with animals, which not only provided meat in abundance, but oil, ivory, bone for arrowheads and spearheads, and skins for rope, and line for fishing and bowstring. However, even a well-armed Viking hunting trip might hesitate to attack that most vicious of animals, the polar bear. Sometimes a marriage had to end in divorce, which was a simple process. The husband or wife, in this case the husband, had to state before witnesses that he desired a divorce, and he sometimes made use of a more eloquent friend to present his case. The wife, if the divorce was granted, was able to take away all her own possessions back to her family. Some of the reasons for a woman seeking a divorce were somewhat unexpected. We hear of a Viking girl asking for a divorce because despite her entreaties for her husband to wear a shirt, he continued to show far too much of his rather hairy chest she got the divorce. Women had more rights in the Viking community than in any other society at the time. They could do business and seal bargains on behalf of their absent husbands. And when a Viking was away practicing his raiding skills, his wife would be in charge of the farmstead, supervising the grinding of grain and instructing the younger girls in all aspects of running a farm. The Vikings drank most of their beer and mead during the long, dark winter months in the north. Hospitality was very important, and much was made of visitors. Vikings were a very generous people, and gifts to strangers could range from a silver bracelet to an entire ship. The evening meal consisted of more than eating and drinking. For stories and poems were recited, and family histories were passed on by word of mouth to each new generation. For the Viking did little in the way of writing. They rejoiced in much talk and boasting of personal prowess in battle. And many years later, such sagas were written down and illustrated. Above the furthest tip of northern Scotland are the Orkney and Shetland Islands. Both were inhabited by the Vikings. On Orkney, Skara Bray and Mays Howe predated the Viking period by many centuries, but were made use of as dwelling places and were made habitable. Birse, on the northwest coast of Orkney, was a Viking village. In Viking days, as in our day, some of the young men were inclined to scribble on the walls and inscribed inside May Howe burial chamber is this heartfelt message. Ingigerth is the most beautiful of women. Even more disturbing, thorny bedded Helgi. Another artist, somewhat less romantically minded but more nautical, engraved his favorite longship. At Lindholm Hoya in North Jutland, there is a vast Viking burial ground containing over 700 graves, all outlined in rocks and boulders in the shape of ships. When it came to the internment of an important chieftain, the ceremony was considerable. One of the finest of the Viking longships was hauled ashore, often the same craft that the chief had used in his raiding journeys, and a small enclosure of wood was built amidships. The body of the chieftain was then dressed in an outfit specially made for the occasion, consisting of hose, trousers, boots, a coat, 
a mantle of silk brocaded with gold buttons, and a hat of silk trimmed with sable. The dead man's nearest relative, holding a flaming torch, then approached naked, set fire to the wood, then threw his torch into the hull. The rest of the funeral party then each approached and tossed their burning torches into the ship, and her contents burned until only ashes were left. Finally, a runic inscription was cut to glorify the chief in his deeds, and the whole party adjourned for a serious drinking session of homemade beer and mead. Again, the mythical two-horned helmet. The shape of the ship must have been deeply engraved in the subconscious mind of the Vikings, for even Viking community centers and military barracks were laid out in the outline of a ship. At Firkat in North Denmark, they built with great mathematical precision 16 large wooden barracks placed in groups of four. The walls were curved convexly, again following ship contours. The whole complex was built inside a large circular rampart surmounted by a wooden palisade overlooking marshy ground. This was impassable to enemy forces, an ideal defensive position. The long ship outline is plainly visible. A replica Viking longhouse has been built at Firkat, showing just how strong these structures had to be to withstand the violent northern gales. The thick reed thatch lasted at least 50 years, warm in winter and cool in summer and the whole structure was massively braced by heavy logs all around. Over 40 Viking graves have been found on the Isle of Man, a large island in the Irish Sea between Wales and Ireland, graves dating back from the 10th century, which is hardly surprising, as Man was used as a base for operations against English and Irish coastal towns by the Viking warrior class, who often intermarried with the local girls. As in Denmark, these Vikings were buried in boat-shaped graves. A comforting thought to the dying chieftain to know that he would shortly be sailing to Valhalla to be greeted by the Valkyries, to feast, to fight, and to drink till the end of time. Although the island is subject to the British crown, man has its own parliament, the Tinwald, a word derived from the Icelandic Thingvellir, or assembly field. Parliamentary events have been part of Manx life here for a thousand years. Not far from the Isle of Man is Dublin, capital city of Ireland. Vikings lived and traded here for many years until after the Battle of Clontarf, when they were finally driven out of Ireland. The foundations of their many trading posts have been discovered near this location beneath the city. Pontarf near Dublin, where the final battle was fought, was a fight to the finish between the ruling Vikings and everybody else as to who was to rule Ireland. Brian Boru was the leader of everybody else, but he took no part in the battle, preferring to spend the day in prayer. The Irish Annals stated, The foreigners of the west of Europe assembled against Brian, and they took with them ten hundred men with coats of mail, a spirited, fierce, violent, vengeful, and furious battle was fought on the Friday before Easter. Brian's prayers were answered, for the Vikings were defeated. Monastic life was the center of the Christian religion in the days of the Vikings over the length and breadth of the British Isles. On Lindisfarne, or Holy Island, the life of the monk was long and arduous. It takes much concentration and effort to rise from one's hard bed at three o'clock 
on an icy morning to attend prayers in an unheated chapel. But there were tools to be made and sandals to be fashioned as monks spent as much time on their feet as on their knees. In addition, there was much sewing of religious vestments to be done, for bishop and serving maid alike. There were domestic animals to be attended to and children to be taught the tenets of the Christian faith by their parents. And it was into this peaceful existence that the fury came out of the north. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle reported that on the 8th of June, the harrying of the heathen miserably destroyed God's church on Lindisfarne, or Holy Island as it is called, and there was much slaughter. Until recently, most historians dismissed the Norsemen as little more than raiders on a grand scale. Their opinions were formed from accounts written by English chroniclers who somewhat naturally portrayed the Vikings in their worst possible light. Raiders, yes, but they were also great explorers and traders. They sailed to all parts of the then known world, bartering furs and slaves for the luxuries of Southeast Europe. Their commercial journeys took them as far as Asia Minor and Arabia. Constantinople was a frequent port of call. One Arab merchant described the Vikings as people of perfect physique, tall as date palms, blonde and ruddy. Small wonder, then, that some of the female captives were not entirely unhappy about their capture. But raiding was basically a summer occupation, and while the long ships swung at their anchor chains during the winter, Viking merchant shipping continued their work day after day, winter and summer, carrying goods far and wide. They used the slower, stockier Canar, the ship which really conquered the Atlantic. Canars were about 50 feet stem to stern and were half-decked fore and aft, providing space for the crew. Livestock was penned amidships. These merchant canars were far more vital to Scandinavia than the more glamorous longships. Guild seamen, though the Vikings were, the North Atlantic to Iceland and Greenland was no pleasure cruise, and not all ships arrived at their destination. York was easily reached by sailing up the rivers of Foss and Ouse from the North Sea. Viking kings ruled here from 866 AD, but little was known of Viking York, or Jorvik, as it was then known, until archaeologists made considerable finds beneath Coppergate, part of the city. Masses of timbers which had formed the foundations of commercial houses were uncovered. Carpenter shops, leather workers, jewelers, potters, tool makers, and even the houses of moneylenders were there. Iceland was one of the first areas to be settled by the Vikings. And here they established one of the first democratic parliaments in the world, at Thinglevir. The location was dramatic, shaped in ages past by violent volcanic action, making a natural platform overlooked by a high lava cliff. Here, Viking chieftains repeated the laws and statutes of the Norse people, just as Moses repeated the law to the Hebrews in the wilderness. But now a new thought was starting to influence the pagan Vikings from frequent contact with the English, many of whom were Christian. This faith had long been an influence in the British Isles, especially in the South and West, 500 years before St. Augustine brought Romanized Christianity to the country. The unthinkable was about to happen. 
Vikings were starting to put aside their Norse gods to accept the Christian faith, which certainly made slow progress until the royal families of Norway accepted it. This cross at Middleton, Yorkshire, has a representation of a Viking carved into it. It is true that in some cases Norse kings fell back into the old ways, but many remained constant. Harold Bluetooth was one. And at a one-time pagan sanctuary at Yelling Jutland, raised a great runestone upon which he had engraved King Harold had this memorial made for Gorm, his father, and Thiri, his mother, that Harold, who won for himself all Denmark and Norway, and who made the Danes Christian. On this great stone is the figure of Christ, the first representation of our Lord in Denmark. In introducing the Christian faith in the Kiev region, Vladimir the Holy demonstrated a typical Viking characteristic. After ceremoniously smashing the local Thor idol, he threw the wooden remains into the river. Following this dramatic act, Vladimir ordered the entire local population into the river at the point of the sword for a mass baptism. One of the attractions of the baptismal service, especially with the ladies, was the gift of a white baptismal robe. Some were so enthused with their baptism that they came back for a second service, thus obtaining a second robe. The conversion of the Vikings to the Christian faith was slow. Many centuries of adherence to the worship of Odin and Thor could not easily be blotted out overnight. But it was the twilight of the Norse gods, and Christianity was ultimately to triumph. Many Vikings became Christians simply by exposure to God-fearing families in England, daughters greatly influencing their pagan husbands. Conversion by example. This is Winchester, ancient capital city of Wessex, and here stands a statue of one of England's greatest kings, Alfred. In 854, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle reported that the heathen for the first time remained in England over the winter instead of returning home. Only this man, Alfred, had the capability of defeating the invaders. But prior to his sea victories, he had to remain hidden among the marsh and bogs of the Somerset wetlands. But even from this remote area, he was able to assemble an army. He was also able to beat the Vikings at their own game. For his ship designers, much to the surprise of the Vikings, were able to design ships that were not only larger, but faster than the long ships of the Vikings. These were totally an English design, and when Alfred's fleet engaged the Vikings in 896, it promptly captured two of them and disabled two more. It was not long before a major sea battle off Weymouth Bay left 20 Viking ships at the bottom of the English Channel. Finally, at Wedmore in Somerset, Alfred and the Vikings signed a peace treaty, which confined them to the eastern part of England. This was their territory and was under Dane law. However, it was an uneasy peace. The southern Saxons and the western Celts looked upon the Danish settlement as the robin looks upon the cuckoo in her nest. Towards the close of the 10th century, Vikings began to pour into the country from all directions. In spite of the vast quantities of silver called Danemjeld paid to the invaders, luckily for the future of the English nation, the Vikings stayed, thus infusing into Celt and Saxon the Nordic line. By the year 960, raid after raid on the churches and monasteries of England, France, and Ireland had left the country stripped of plunder with ruined and impoverished farmhouses, untilled fields. In France, King Charles bought off many Viking freebooters with Dungel amounting to thousands of pounds weight of silver. And a baby boy was born out of wedlock, who in later life was to have a devastating effect on the future of England. His name was Guillaum, William in English. He was a direct descendant of the Normani, or Northmen, which gave their name to the land, Normandy. William fell in love with his pretty cousin Matilda and proposed marriage. 
I'd sooner become a nun than marry a bastard, was Matilda's curt reply. Immediately upon receiving this stinging answer, William rode furiously over to Matilda's castle, seizing her by her long hair, dragged her screaming across the floor. Matilda, somewhat impressed with William's overtures, then decided that she loved him after all, married him, and made for William the Conqueror a very level-headed and intelligent Queen of England, to whom William remained totally faithful to the surprise of his later biographers. A vivid pictorial account of William's invasion of England has been preserved in the Bayur Tapestry. Both Harold Hadrada of Norway and Spain Esdrisen of Denmark had laid claims to the English throne, but so did William. The tapestry shows in dramatic form shipwrights chopping down trees and preparing the wood for the many invasion barges, their lines so similar to the Viking longships. The Normans walked their horses down to the barges, the nervous animals needing some encouragement. Then the invasion armada set sail for England. Tapestry says, we make for Pevensey, and continues, we hasten ashore. His fleet landed without difficulty at Pevensey in Sussex, and a local rail station is named in honor of this event. The hungry must be fed, and we make camp at Hastings. Here they built this castle, the first in England, on an almost impregnable headland. Harold is told that the invaders are putting the country to fire and sword, and he marches south. At Senlec Field, the Norman cavalry advance, then break into a charge, and the battle for Britain commences. The results of the battle are well known. The English king, Harold, is killed, and on Christmas Day, 1066, William of Normandy was crowned King of England, greatly to that country's benefit. This event brought the Viking Age nearly to its close. Very few historians seem to be able to point to the original homeland of the Vikings, but a faint light illuminates a surprising location, the Middle East. The historian David Wilson states in his book, The Vikings and Their Origins, Goths the ancestors of the Vikings inhabited the Baltic coast and spread into Europe, westward from the Black Sea area in about 300 AD. Centuries earlier, their ancestors were Cimmerian and Scythian Israel, also on their westward migration. Wilson's origin for the Vikings as Cimmerians and Scythian Israel has been confirmed by Assyrian cuneiform tablets found in Nineveh, in the excavations of the Royal Library of King Assurbanipal. Translated by Professor Waterman of the University of Michigan, they report the escape of hundreds of thousands of the so-called lost tribes of Israel westward, at about the same time in history as the vast numbers of Scythians appear in history. It is a fact that after the fall of the Assyrian capital Nineveh in 612 BC, the Israel people, known by several different names, spread all around the shore of the Black Sea and into southern Russia, then called Scythia, then gradually into southeastern Europe. They took the name of the country they passed through, thus they were called Scythians, ancient progenitors of the Viking people. In the first century, Tacitus wrote of a people who must surely have sired the Vikings. The Suenis, a people well-armed, acquisitive and skilled in the sailing of curiously shaped ships with a carved prow at either end. The route lay always westward, following the setting sun, towards a new land that they were then not even aware of, the isles and coastlands of the west. One group of the Scandinavians came a Viking to the British Isles, 
later to infuse into the bloodline of the Kelto-Saxon English that Nordic strain which fathered an inherent desire to see what was over the next horizon, be it land or sea. Their curiosity led them to discover a new land far to the west, America. But that is another story in another program. Israel's migration westward was part of a great trans-Europe movement. They were called over the generations by many different names. Normans, Saxons, Danes, Gauls, Goths, and Vikings. All originally one Caucasian people, displaying many of the later Viking characteristics. Thanks to archaeology, we have proof of the fulfillment of God's covenant with Abraham, as written into the scriptures, that he would become the father of many nations, and would spread to the south, the north, the east, and the west, and that his descendants would become as multitudinous as the sands of the seashore, and as the stars in their courses. They came from the cold and hostile north, pillaging monasteries and putting whole villages to fire and sword, and they profaned the churches. From the 8th century in England, all places of worship resounded with a new and fervent prayer. Deliver us, O Lord, from the fury of the Norsemen. The fear the monastic clergy had for these violent raiders was vividly penned by one of the English monks. 